is it will be useful for us, especially at this time when we might be a little uncertain of what's ahead of us. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next with uh, what's happening in the world. And I think this can be a really good time for us to have some reflection on where we are as a community and as individual brothers and sisters in Christ in our community, that we might uh, take what Malachi has to say and apply it to ourselves and see whether we are preparing ourselves and readying ourselves for the coming kingdom of God. It's a, it's a difficult book. It's uh, got some very harsh words for the people in the days of Malachi. But the wonderful thing is that the, the people did listen, and we know they listened because Malachi, uh, sorry, Nehemiah, who is the, um, the main Bible character, if you like, at the time of Malachi, who had gone to Persia, and while he was in Persia, the people uh, rebelled against the word of God, and uh, Nehemiah comes back, and he reforms the people based on the prophecy of Malachi. So they did eventually listen to the message, and that, of course, is an encouragement for us. So let's uh, give a little bit of a historical background to the prophecy of Malachi. The generation before Malachi's day, or the couple of generations before, had come back from captivity in Babylon. They'd been there, of course, for 70 years. God had caused them to go into captivity because of the idolatry, the immorality, their rebellion against God, uh, the things that Jeremiah in particular spoke out against. And uh, they were taken into captivity for 70 years, but then they returned according to the prophecy that Jeremiah gave. And we know that they began by rebuilding the temple. They rededicated themselves to the law of God, and they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So for a time, everything's wonderful. They, they've returned as a people. They've been if you like, resurrected as a nation, like a little precursor to the, the resurrection of the people that we saw in the last century. And everything's wonderful for a time. But by the time we come to the prophecy of Malachi, everything has gone downhill. The people have profaned the temple. And this is some of the strong language in Malachi. He doesn't hold back. He says, you are profaning the things of God. So they profaned the temple. They opened the gates. They, they put these gates on the walls of Jerusalem, and they're opening the gates on the Sabbath day and continuing with their trade on the Sabbath day, completely disregarding God's principle of the Sabbath. And they despised the law of God and the things to do with God. So everything that they've rebuilt, they've now dismantled. Not just uh, not in a physical sense, obviously. The, the temple is still there. The walls of Jerusalem are still there. They're still offering in the temple. They're still going about their religious duty. But spiritually speaking, everything's been dismantled. They have taken what Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and Joshua have, have built up, and they've taken it all apart. And it wasn't obvious. It's not as if they're bowing down to idols. It's not obvious that they're... Uh, committing immoral acts. Outwardly, they, they appear to be a religious people, but really what's happening here is that they're going through the motions. Their heart is not in it. They have a very lackadaisical uh, view of their religion, and while they're bringing their offerings to the temple, they're bringing that which is blemished. They're bringing that which is um, not their best. And it's a, it's a huge lesson for us, brothers and sisters, as Christadelphians in the last days. Are we bringing our best? Are we just going through the motions of our religion? Or are we completely focused on what uh, God has asked us to do? So as far as the, the prophecy itself, if I just share my slide again, I've got a little um, chart here. On the next slide, of a breakdown of Malachi, and you can see there it forms this parallelism that I've I've shown in the colours here, 
So this is what is called a chiastic structure. You may have heard of one of these, where we have this parallelism, where the, the first element in the, in the chiasm um, mirrors or is parallel with the, the last item. So here in Malachi, you can see that uh, in red here, in chapter 1, right at the beginning of the prophecy, God declares his love for Jacob and his hatred for Esau. So God actually starts off in his prophecy very, very positively. He says, I have loved you. And he declares that love straight away. And that is paralleled with the end of the prophecy, the end of chapter th uh, 3, and then the, the beginning of chapter 4, where God again declares his love for the righteous and hatred for the wicked. So th this, this forms like the bookend of this prophecy. It's enveloped by the love of God. That's the motivation behind God inspiring Malachi now to, to speak to his people. He loves his people and he wants them to change. And we've got to receive the, the words of Malachi in that spirit. God isn't just telling people off here. He's a loving father who wants his people to listen and change their ways. Now in green here, the, the rest of chapter one details the problem the outward problem. They were bringing offerings. They, they were religious people, but they were bringing blemished offerings. They weren't bringing their best. And that's paralleled by uh, chapter 3 here, verses 6 to 12, where it says that they were actually robbing God of their offerings. They were, instead of giving the, the produce of the land to God, bringing their tithes and so forth, and the, the best, the first fruits to God, they were keeping that for themselves. They were giving something to God, but they were keeping the best for themselves, and in that sense then, they were robbing God. Now, the problem is intensified when we realize this isn't just the people. This is the leaders of the people who are part of the problem. And so we have this part in blue, the beginning of chapter 2, we learn about the, the failure of the Levitical priests. They were not teaching the people. They were not getting the message across. And this is one of the important things about the, the book of Malachi. Malachi uh, is probably not a name of somebody. It's probably just a title. It means my messenger. And it's the same word, Malach, that is used all the way through the Old Testament for the messengers of God, particularly the angels of God. That's the word Malak. So here is God's messenger delivering a message to the people because the message at the moment is not being delivered. Those who should have been the Malak, the Malachi of God, the priests and the Levites, were not doing their God. They, they weren't getting the message across. And that's the overriding lesson of this whole thing. Are we listening to God's message? Are we delivering it, and are we listening to God's message? And so God, in chapter 3, is going to take matters into his own hands, and he's going to, um, in a very famous prophecy at the beginning of chapter 3, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, he will prepare the way before me. That's that prophecy of John the Baptist, who is going to deliver God's message in New Testament times. And then the end of verse 1 of chapter 3 says, and the messenger of the covenant shall come. And that's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Then we have this period of about 300 years where there's silence. And then bang, chapter uh, 3 verse 1 comes to pass with God now sending out his message through John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what's failing then in the days of Malachi. They're not getting... They're not delivering and they're not listening to the message of God. So in chapter 2, verse 17 to chapter 3, verse 5, God says, I am going to purify the priesthood. We're going to talk about this more in class number 3, where God says in Malachi, you have a choice. You can either carry on as you're, you are and have this very easy, lackadaisical kind of religion, and you will then suffer the consequences, which is the, the fiery wrath of God in the final judgment, or you can choose to submit to the purifying fire right now. 
And of course, that's a choice that we have. Are we going to wait until the last judgment or are we going to learn the lesson now and go through God's purification process to prepare us for his kingdom? And then right in the middle of Malachi, in chapter 2, uh, the, the last half of chapter 2, we have a, a, a key word there which says, what was the problem with the people? They were unfaithful or faithless. Of course, that, what, that's what happens when we fail to listen to the message of God. We know what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. When we don't listen to the word of God, then we become unfaithful. And that was the end result. So you have here the people of God, God's children, who are unfaithful to him. And in fact, if you look at the end of chapter 2, he uses the analogy of marriage. And of course, when there is unfaithfulness in marriage, and Malachi suggests by talking about this at the end of chapter 2, that this was what was going on in the days of Malachi, that there were marriages that were breaking up. There were husbands and wives being unfaithful to each other. And I think the reason why Malachi uses that analogy is because that is how God feels when we are unfaithful to him. We know that in the, in the Old Testament, the, the analogy of uh, God uh, being married to Israel is used a number of times. I think Isaiah and Jeremiah both use this idea of, of uh, Israel being, or, or God being a husband to Israel. And so when we are unfaithful to God, when, if you look at chapter 2, verse um, chapter two verse 11, it says that Israel has married the daughter of a foreign or a, or a strange God. That's how God feels when we uh, go against his message, when we're unfaithful to his message. It's the same feeling that a spouse has when their husband or wife is unfaithful to them. God feels it. And so God is trying to express his love for his, his wife, as it were, in Malachi. Come back to me. I love you. That's, that's the appeal that God makes then to, to his people. All right, well, let's, um, let me just stop sharing that for a moment. Let's go to Malachi chapter 1 and see how God begins his appeal. So in verse 1, we have the introduction, the oracle or the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Then it says in verse 2, straight away, God says, I have loved you. But look at their response in verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? And you'll see this. If you read through Malachi, you'll see that Malachi echoes the response of the people a number of times, about seven, eight, or nine times. God says something through Malachi, like, I have loved you. And the people respond saying, what are you talking about? It's as if it goes in one ear and out the other. They're just not getting it. They're, they're absolutely oblivious to their problems. So they, God says, I have loved you. And they say, what, what do you mean God loves us? And there's, uh, there's hints in Malachi that perhaps things were a little bit difficult at this time for the people. Uh, there's a suggestion in chapter 3 of Malachi, actually, where it talks about uh, the devourer, that perhaps the, the, uh, the crops in Israel at the time were being devoured by some sort of plague of insects or something like that. So not, not a coronavirus in the days of Malachi, but there was something going on that was... Um, making the people uncertain of their future. There was economic distress. They were going through a trial, and they interpret this as God not loving them, as God departing from them. Wherein have you loved us? But, of course, what God, what God is doing here by uh, saying, I have loved you, and by um, then bringing this trial into their lives, is he's trying to get their attention. He's bringing these trials into their lives because he loves them. And that's what they're, they're not understanding. Now, have a look at verse 6 of Malachi, because I think this is one of the, 
the real key verses of this prophecy down in verse 6 of chapter 1. And this, I think, really expresses the, the mindset that the people have got themselves into. What was the problem? Verse 6 of chapter 1, it says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. Can you imagine priests of Yahweh despising the name of God? It's incredible. And again, the oblivious uh, response comes back at the end of verse 6. But you say, how have we despised your name? They're just not getting it. They don't understand where they've gone wrong. And that, I think, brothers and sisters, is a lesson for us, is that we can sort of breeze through life, go through the motions of our religion as Christadelphians, and think because we go to meeting, we do our readings, we say our prayers, and so forth, we go to Bible class, that somehow just by going through the motions of that activity, that everything's fine. And then when we are admonished by the word of God, we're oblivious to it. That's, that's the problem with these people. They just don't understand where they've gone wrong. And what they've lost there, we see in verse 6, is the honor and the fear of Yahweh. They've lost their respect for God. And we'll see the idea of the fear of God comes out over and over again in uh, the prophecy of Malachi. Now, another, another key verse is over in chapter 2. So in chapter 2, we learn about the, the failure of the priesthood. And in chapter 2 here in verse 8, this is another verse to really highlight. He says to the priests, actually, we're going at verse 7, because verse 7 says that you priests should be the messengers of the word of God. So it says in verse 7, for the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. People should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is Malachi. See that? When it says he is the messenger, the Malak. They should have been the messengers of God. But verse 8 says, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. So the priests were instructing people. It's not as if they just shut their mouths and weren't teaching. But what they were teaching was causing people to stumble. They should have been preparing the way. As it says in chapter 3, verse 1, God is going to send his messenger to prepare the way. So that's what they should have been doing, preparing the way for the people to walk towards the kingdom. But instead, they were putting stumbling blocks there. They were putting stones in people's paths and things that would divert people off track. Of course, that's a terrible thing. And then it says um, again in verse 8, you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. And that is one of the major things that has happened in the days of Malachi is that they have corrupted a covenant that they have made with God. And in effect, then, brothers and sisters, what has happened here is that they have completely lost their heritage. Because what we're going to see is in the historical background that's contained in the book of Nehemiah, we see there that the people make a covenant with God like a marriage covenant, same principle. And they, being unfaithful, have broken that covenant. They've broken their promise to God. That's, that, that is the, the main problem that's going on. So let's think then for a while, what was the heritage of the previous generations that came out of captivity, that rebuilt the temple, that rebuilt the walls, what was that heritage that now the people in Malachi's day have lost? To do that, we want to go back to the, uh, the book of Nehemiah. So open your Bibles at Nehemiah and go to chapter 1. As I said earlier, Nehemiah was um, the main character of the days of Malachi. He was not in the land when things went downhill. <laughs> 
uh, Nehemiah, at the end of chapter 12, has gone back to Persia for a while. And while he's gone, everything goes downhill. And then he comes back in chapter 13. He takes the prophecy of Malachi and he reforms the people. He purifies the priesthood and he, he brings them back to the covenant. So what was the heritage of Nehemiah? What was it that Nehemiah exemplified in his, uh, his example? Well, at the beginning of Nehemiah, he is in Persia and he's hearing about the problems that are going on in Jerusalem. And he feels inspired, moved to go back and help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We know that's exactly what he did. The book of Nehemiah, the first half, is all about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Now, what we want to have a look at in chapter 1 is the attitude of mind of Nehemiah. This is the heritage that they've lost. Let's have a look at the prayer that Nehemiah utters. And we're going to see some of the language of Nehemiah's prayer is taken up by Malachi and used in his admonishment of the people. So in chapter 1 here of Nehemiah, it says in verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, he's heard about the problems in Jerusalem. Here. I sat down and wept and mourned for days. So I just lost my place a minute. Uh, where am I? I mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Verse 5. Now listen to, this, listen to this language, brothers and sisters, and just think, where is Nehemiah getting this language from? Because he's actually quoting over and over a particular passage from earlier in the Old Testament. He says in verse 5, O Yahweh God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Now think first of all about that attitude of mind of Nehemiah. That is his reverence that he has. We just saw in Malachi, they've, they've lost their honor. They've lost their fear for God. Here Nehemiah addresses God as the great and awesome God. So that's point number one, the great and awesome God. Do we regard Yahweh as great and awesome? Do we look at his work in creation and so, so forth and just bow our heads in awe at how awesome this God is, which should produce in us a mindset that is not going to be blasé and lackadaisical and, and half-hearted about our religion? When we think how great God is, I mean, just think about this, this coronavirus. I don't know whether this is a sign of the times that uh, we got this invisible virus that is causing such havoc. But we know what the scripture says, that, that, that God created all things. He is in control of all creation. And, and just think of the power he has to be able to bring all of the nations of the world to their knees by a little invisible virus. Is this what God, God is doing right now? Is he bringing the nations to their knees? We, we don't know what. Uh, whether this fits into prophecy, but it just shows that if, you knew, if you're in charge of creation, you are a great and awesome God. And uh, that's the God whom we serve. He is in control of all things. So we, we've got to get into that mindset, brothers and sisters, of the awesomeness and the greatness of God. Now, it says in verse 5 there, he's great and awesome. And here's the contrast with the people. This is a God who keeps covenant. That is one of the central attributes of this great and awesome God. He keeps covenant. He's a God that can be relied on. He's a God that is dependable. He's a God that we can trust in. And that's the spirit that the people have lost. They've made a covenant with God and they've broken the covenant. Well, that's not who our God is. Our God is a God who keeps covenant. And in the word there, I think in the King James might say mercy in my version, it says steadfast love. It's the word kesed. It's a word used continually throughout the Old Testament. It's part of the core character of God, kesed. And it, it's the idea of the, the loyalty of God and the love that God has for his people. It, it's, it's a word that is most often used in the context of the kind of love that, 
that binds people together in a covenant relationship. And it's part of the character of God. It's part of the name of God. You remember when the name was revealed to Moses on the mountain? Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. That's the word kesed and truth or faithfulness. So kesed, steadfast love, this loyal covenant love is part of the name of God. And what's happened in the days of Malachi is that they are despising the name of God. They're not living up to this core character that uh, God himself gives as an example. So carrying on here in Nehemiah 1 verse 5, uh, keeps covenant and steadfast, steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So this is not meant to be a one-sided thing. It's not that God, this is a relationship where God loves us and we just receive that love. We're meant to reciprocate that love. That's our side of the covenant. We're meant to love him too and keep his commandments. And we understand that. Then he goes on in verse 6, Let your ear be attentive, your eyes open, to hear the prayer of your servant, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, of which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. So Nehemiah there, in reverence for God, acknowledges the, uh, the fact that the people had sinned. That's why they went into captivity in the first place. And then in verse 7, We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, statutes, and rules that commanded your servant Moses. So we haven't, historically speaking, kept our side of the covenant. So verse 8, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. Now he's going to quote from Moses. And he's going to quote from the book of Deuteronomy. And you'll recognize where the quote comes from. It comes from the curses in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The, the book of Deuteronomy that he quotes from is called the book of the covenant. It's, it's God's covenant with his people. And now he's going to quote from that book of the covenant. He's going to quote from the terms of the covenant. And so he says, uh, the words you said to Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, there's that key word. That key problem with the people, they have been unfaithful to God. So Nehemiah says, if you are unfaithful, what is God going to do? I will scatter you among the people. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. And of course, historically speaking, that's exactly what's happened. They were unfaithful in the days of Jeremiah. They were scattered, but they learned their lesson in their captivity. They're now keeping God's commandments. They've returned to the land. They've rebuilt the temple. Now they're going to rebuild the walls. So God has kept his covenant. He's kept his promise. But now in the days of Malachi, they're going right back to what was, ha what was happening before they went into captivity in the first place. And one of the interesting things about Malachi is that he echoes a lot of the words of Jeremiah. Now, when you think about what was going on in the days of Jeremiah, I mean, there was outright idolatry, gross immorality, complete unfaithfulness to God. The nation was irredeemable. And as a result of their unfaithfulness, God scattered them among the nations and they were led into captivity. So Malachi, when he keeps echoing Jeremiah, and we'll see an example of that in a moment, when he echoes Jeremiah, he's saying, you're not obviously idolatrous. It's not as if in the days of Malachi they're bowing down to idols. They're bringing their offerings to the temple. They look like they're a good religious people. but Inwardly, they're exactly the same. They're just like the people who went into captivity in the days of Jeremiah. They have the same spirit. And so Malachi is a warning not to go back to that again, because if God, God scattered them once, he'll scatter them again. So that's, that's the main um, exhortation to take from it. So returning back to Nehemiah chapter 1, it says in verse 10, 
They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. We'll just leave that, that section there. So here again, Nehemiah refers to the, the greatness of God, the strength of God. Now, Nehemiah himself, this is, this is the heritage then of uh, the people that, that the people in Malachi's day have lost. The greatness, the awesomeness of God, the recognition that God keeps covenant, that God loves them. Now, all of this language that Nehemiah uses, he didn't just come up with it off the top of his head. He is quoting over and over again, again, that book of Deuteronomy. And in particular, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 7. So let's just have a look at that. Uh, if you want to turn back to Deuteronomy and chapter 7. This is, as I said earlier, this is the book of the covenant. This is the, the terms of God's relationship with his people. This is the outlining of God's love for his people. And you might not be aware of this, but the word love is very, very rare in the books of Moses. It's found about three or four times all the way through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Hardly found at all in the first four books. But then in the book of Deuteronomy, suddenly the love of God is poured out to his people. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, the, chapter be the one before we're just going to look at, is the, uh, the, the Shema that the, the Jews call it. The, the most important law in the entire Old Testament, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. So this is the book of God's love. This is the heritage of the people. This was the heritage of Nehemiah. Now have a look at then uh, some of the language here in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Remembering how Malachi opened up his prophecy. He said, I have loved you. God, in a word there, by saying I have loved you, is reminding the people of his covenant with them and the kind of relationship he wants with them. Now, why does God love them? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 7 explains why God loves them. So let's go in here. You, you'll recognize these words and you'll see how Nehemiah picks up on the spirit of them. So Deuteronomy chapter 7, it says in verse 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. There are people who are special for God. They're holy to him. They're set apart by him. They're, they're sanctified by him. They're special to him. One of the key words in the book of Deuteronomy is the word profane, which is the opposite of the word holy. So whereas the people are holy to God, the people in the days of Malachi are being profane, the opposite of holiness. So again, verse 6, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples are on the face of the earth. Verse 7, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because Yahweh loves you. And those are the words echoed by Nehemiah. Uh, in uh, sorry by Malachi in Malachi chapter 1 verse 2 I have loved you going right back here to where God says I have loved you not because you're the greatest of all people but simply because I love you and, and I'm keeping my covenant that I made with Abraham Isaac and Jacob um, so verse 8 is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God expressed his love and his desire to have a relationship with this people by showing his mighty hand. That's part of the, the words you remember in Nehemiah chapter 1. The strong or mighty hand of God. That's repeated if you look down in verse 19. Talk there about the mighty or the strong hand of God there again. So God had showed his mighty hand by bringing them out of captivity in Egypt. 
He's shown them again his mighty hand in bringing them out of captivity in Babylon in, in the context of Malachi. And the people have forgotten this. They've forgotten the mighty hand of God. Now look at verse 9. Again, Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God. The faithful God. That is who God is. He doesn't just do faithful things. He actually is faithful. That's the core character of, of this God whom we serve. So that's what's been turned upside down in the days of Malachi. They are unfaithful. So they are unholy. They are unfaithful. Uh, carrying on there in verse 9. Who, and these are the words echoed by Nehemiah in his prayer, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. You see the language there of, of Nehemiah. I mean, he's more or less quoting these verses. Um, and then in verse 11, our side of the covenant, you shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you. So there's the language that, again that uh, Nehemiah used. Now, if you go down to verse 21, it says in verse 21, you shall not be in dread of them, the people of the land, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. You see, that's the language of Malachi. That's the language of Nehemiah. That's what he understood, that the nations were nothing. This is a great and awesome God. So, brothers and sisters, that's the spirit of Deuteronomy. That's the spirit of Nehemiah. That's the spirit of the generation before Malachi's generation. They had this deep respect and reverence for this great and awesome God. Now, one of uh, the, the key words there that we've looked at is the word great. And if I just share my screen again, I can show you back in Malachi. In chapter one, so you can see there I've listed on the screen. Uh, the four times in, in verse 5, twice in verse 11, and once in verse 14, where Malachi says that God is great. Uses the same word that Deuteronomy and uh, Nehemiah uses. So right off the bat, he reminds the people of the greatness of Yahweh. But as you read through these verses, brothers and sisters, just notice what Malachi is saying here. Notice the theme that runs through the expression of the greatness of God. And there's a really key lesson for us here. So in verse 5, it says, Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is Yahweh. But notice what it says. Beyond the borders of Israel. Now that should take the recipients of Malachi's prophecy that, that, that should make them stand up and listen. Great is Yahweh, but beyond the border of Israel. Now look at verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name, which they're profaning in the days of Malachi, will be great among the nations. And in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering, for my name will be great, yes, but among the nations. And in verse 14, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. You see the theme there. It just sort of jumps out of you, doesn't it? That, uh, yes, God's name is great. God is great. There is, there is an acknowledgement here of the greatness of God. But it's among the nations. It's beyond the borders of Israel. And it's as if Malachi is saying to the people here, if you cannot recognize the, the greatness and the awesomeness of God because of his faithfulness, because of his love, because of this covenant that he's made with you, if you're not going to acknowledge that greatness of God, if you're going to be half-hearted in your appreciation for what God has done for you, if you're going to be uh, lackadaisical and bring blemished offerings, then God is perfectly capable of finding people beyond the borders of Israel, in the nations, outside of Israel, 
who will recognize his greatness. And so there's a, a little warning there for the people of God. Yes, they are the people of God. They are holy. They are uh, this, this chosen nation of God. But if they're not going to give God the, the honor and the fear that is due to him, God will go outside the borders of Israel to find people who do appreciate him. And of course, that's a lesson for us. We are Christadelphians, brothers and sisters. We believe that we are the people of God. But if we don't appreciate who God is, we don't ascribe the greatness that is due unto God by being half-hearted in our religion, then God is perfectly capable of finding people who are not Christadelphians who will give him the glory due to his name. And Jesus picks up on this in his parable, you remember in Matthew chapter 22, the parable of the wedding feast, where people are called to this wedding feast. It's, it's, a, it's a picture of being called to the kingdom of God. And it says there that the people who were called made light of it. I mean, how, how can you ever make light of the call to the kingdom? But that's exactly what happened in the, in the days of um, Malachi and in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in that parable, you remember in Matthew 22, he says, uh, the one who called them to the wedding feast then said, okay, we'll go somewhere else to look for people who do want to come to the wedding feast. And it says they went to the highways and byways. And the, the idea behind the word for highways and byways are the, the border roads. So borders were marked by roads. And on one side of the road was Israel, and then the other side of the road was outside Israel. So in effect, what the the master does in that parable is he goes beyond the borders of Israel to find people who want to go to the wedding feast. So that's a lesson for us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Do we want to be in the kingdom of God more than anything else? The invitation is being given to us. Are, are we embracing that with uh, wholeheartedness, with singleness of mind, with, with zeal, with energy, with enthusiasm, giving our best in appreciation for uh, the invitation that God has given to us. And that's what the people again have lost in the days of Malachi. All right, well, let's, let's, let's return back to uh, Nehemiah. Again, if anyone wants to interrupt at any point, uh, that's fine. Come back with me to Nehemiah and chapter, uh, chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. What's going on in Nehemiah chapter 9 now? Time has obviously moved on. They, the people have grabbed on to the spirit of Nehemiah. They are ascribing greatness to God at this point. And they've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And now they have time to pause and reflect. And what happens in Nehemiah chapter 9 is that they've gotten, gotten together as kind of like, like in a kind of Bible school. And they've had a, a series of classes on the history of their nation and all the problems that that nation has gone through and the, um, the problems that they brought on themselves by their unfaithfulness to God. But continually throughout Nehemiah chapter 9, there's a reminder of the faithfulness of Yahweh. And God keeps on pouring out his love for his people. Now, in appreciation for this great God, what happens in Nehemiah chapter 9 is the people decide to make a covenant. They decide to renew their commitment to God. So if you look at the very last verse of Nehemiah 9, it says, Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document of the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So the signatories of this covenant they're going to make are the Levites and the priests. They're the ones who are not teaching the, the message in, in Malachi. Now, if you look at the beginning of chapter 10, the first 27 verses there, we get the, the signatories of this covenant. And then in the rest of chapter 10, we get the terms of the covenant. And uh, all the things that the people have agreed that they are going to do in appreciation for what God has done for them. So um, let me just summarize that for you. 
on this next slide. Uh, actually, we're going to miss that one out. Uh, this slide. So you can see there on this slide that there are about uh, eight or so terms to this covenant. They're going to keep the law of Moses. Um, they're going to keep the Sabbath. They're going to bring their offerings and so forth. So you can look through chapter 10 and you can see outlined. These are the things that the people promised to do. This is the, the covenant now that they're making with, with God. What's interesting about this is that when we come now to Nehemiah chapter 13, so there's that list again, Nehemiah chapter 10. Here's the same list in Nehemiah chapter 13. And when Nehemiah comes back, he finds that every single element of this covenant has been broken and needs to be corrected. And you can see that all the way through chapter 13. And nearly all of them, there's just a couple of them that are not mentioned, but nearly all of them are part of the prophecy of Malachi. So that, in a nutshell, is what Malachi's message is about. People have broken this covenant. Malachi goes through how they've broken it, step by step, and says, you've got to, carry, you've got to get back to the, the spirit of uh, those who went before you. And... Um, you can look through Nehemiah chapter 13. Just look at one particular element here in Nehemiah chapter 13. This is incredible. You, you'll know this verse very well. It says in chapter 13 here in verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, who was related to Tobiah. Now you know who Tobiah was? He's the enemy in the rest of the book. So the enemy of the Jews, well, look what it says in verse 5. They prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering and frankincense. So where they had previously stored all of the offerings and the tithes, they've cleared that out and they turned it into a bedroom for the enemy. That's how low things have gotten. They, they, they've, they've brought the world right into the ecclesia. And so chapter 13 is, Mal is, is Nehemiah coming back, taking the, uh, Malachi's prophecy and implementing all the necessary changes. All right. Now I said we were going to see, and we've only got a few minutes left, but we did start a little bit late, so I'm going to steal some minutes. Um, I just want to show you a couple of connections with Jeremiah. Come with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 31. As I said earlier, Malachi echoes a lot back to the words of Jeremiah. Because he says to the people, you are acting just like the people acted in Jeremiah's day. It's the same spirit. It's not so obvious, but it's the same problem. And where Malachi says, I have loved you, he's not just echoing from Deuteronomy, he's also echoing from Jeremiah. Now, one of the reasons for this is because Jeremiah happens to be a commentary on the book of Deuteronomy. Jeremiah is basically, uh, the book of Deuteronomy was found in the days of Josiah. They found it in the temple. And uh, Josiah opened up the book and he's reading the book of Deuteronomy for the first time and he, he tears his clothes and he, he brings up all these reforms based on the book of Deuteronomy. And Jeremiah prophesied you in that time. And basically the book of Jeremiah is, have a look at what it says in Deuteronomy. You're not doing it. You better get back to doing it. So Jeremiah is like Malachi. He says, you've broken the terms of the covenant, the book of the covenant, the book of Deuteronomy. Now get back to it. Now, Jeremiah chapter 31 is in the middle of this prophecy, which is, you know, when you read through Jeremiah and your readings, it's so negative with all the judgments that, that Jeremiah uh, prophesies. But nestled in the middle of Jeremiah in chapter 31 and in, in the chapters around it is this message of hope. And this is the, the passage here, which is about the new covenant that God will make. So chapter 31, verse 31, says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant 
with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And we know that points forward to the covenant that God uh, makes through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is in Malachi the messenger of the covenant. So God is going to take matters into his own hands. He says, you keep breaking these covenants I make with you. Well, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And that's to do with the, the Lord Jesus Christ, where, where God finally solves the problem of uh, sin and faithlessness. Now, in that context of Jeremiah 31, notice what it says in verse 1. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. So here is God expressing his desire to be in covenant relationship with his people. Verse 2. <clears throat> Sorry, John is just uh, telling me to end in five minutes. That's, that's okay. We can do that. Uh, we'll probably just end in, in Jeremiah 31 then and pick up, pick up next week. Um, so Jeremiah 31 verse um, 1. God is declaring his covenant relationship with the people. In verse 2, thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away. And here it is. I have loved you. That's what Malachi repeats right at the beginning of his prophecy. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, God says, I have continued my faithfulness to you. There's God expressing who he is. He's a God who loves them. And he is going to continue being faithful to his covenant. That's the God whom we serve. So it says in verse 4, because of this, and despite what Jeremiah says in the rest of his prophecy, where he says that Babylon is going to come and destroy the temple and destroy the city. But verse 4 says, because God loves them, because God is faithful to his people, verse 4, again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. So despite the fact that God would cause destruction in the land, God is going to rebuild them. And the people have experienced that in living memory in the days of Malachi. God has kept his covenant. He's brought them out of captivity as he's promised. He's allowed them to rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls. And now unfortunately in the days of Malachi, they're throwing it right back in the face of God, and they are reverting back to the problems that brought them into captivity in the first place. So God willing, next week, we're going to see how Malachi picks up on this principle here in chapter 31 uh, about rebuilding. And we're going to see um, some uh, interesting connections um, elsewhere where Jeremiah uses very similar language. Mm -hmm.